Hey everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and in this video I want to talk about the alkylation reaction of carbonyls, which is an incredibly important carbon-carbon bond formation reaction. As this is going to be one of the core reactions that you are going to be using for your synthesis in the second semester curriculum, I am going to focus on both the mechanism of this reaction and the synthetic applications. And of course, we are going to talk about some limitations of this reaction as well. Let's start by looking at the general scheme of the reaction. In a nutshell, we are going to be taking some sort of a carbonyl, in this particular case I am just using the acetone as an example molecule over here, and we are going to be treating that with a strong base in order to form an enolate anion over here. Then we are going to take our enolate, which is going to be a nucleophile, and we are going to react it with some sort of typically alkyl halide in order to make a new carbon-carbon bond. And before we go into the mechanism of this reaction, there are a couple of extremely important moments that I want to point out here. First of all, we are going to require a complete enolization of our carbonyl compound. That's why in the first step of this reaction we are going to require the use of a strong base. If we are going to use a weaker base, let's say I will start with my acetone as well, and I'm going to use one of the typical weaker bases, something like sodium ethoxate for instance, as a result of this enolization equilibrium I am going to get my enolate as well. However, if we take into consideration the pKa values of our acids on each side, where the acetone's pKa is roughly 19 and ethanol is about 16, the equilibrium constant in this case is going to be 10 to the power of 16 minus 19, giving us 10 to the negative third power. And that means that the enolization process here overall is not particularly favorable, which means that we have a very small quantity of our enolate present, and the rest of our solution here is going to be our initial base. So in this case, if I were to bring this solution, which is predominantly sodium ethoxide, and bring it together uh, with the electrophile, whatever my electrophile file might be some sort of alkyl halide here, then the major outcome is going to be reaction between these two guys, and we are going to have just a little bit of our enolate reacting with the electrophile, which means that our yield in this case is going to be, well, very low. If instead I do this reaction in the presence of a very powerful base, something like LDA, let's say, I am going to get my enolate as well. But now, if we do the same calculations for my equilibrium constant, we are going to get 10 to the 17th power instead, which is a highly favorable equilibrium towards the product, which means that we have essentially 100% of our enolate and our risk of side reactions is going to be minimal. So the typical basis that you are going to be using for these type of reactions is going to be LDA, which is our good old friend uh, lithium diazopropylamine, and of course you can have similarly looking bases as well, or another common choice is going to to be simple hydrides, such as sodium hydride, potassium hydride, or you might even see lithium hydride. But most commonly what you are going to be seeing either LDA or sodium hydride as the two main choices that you are most likely going to be seeing within the scope of your course when we are dealing with the alkylation of the carbonyls. And another important point that I want to bring up here is that the enols don't really work in this reaction. I will remind you that the enol is the species with the OH group, while the enolate is the negatively charged version of that, it's essentially a conjugate base of the enol. And due to the excess of the electron density, due to that negative negative charge, enolates are significantly more nucleophilic than the enols, and within the scope of this reaction, enolates work well, while enols don't really work almost at all. There are a couple of examples that I have seen in the literature where enols have been used for that reaction, but those things are really rare and pretty much for our course, basically never try to use enol for this type of a reaction, always use enolate instead. And generally speaking, it is easy to avoid that mistake because we are going to be using the basic conditions here and the enolates are made in base while the enols are going to be produced in the acidic conditions. And since we are not going to be using acidic conditions here, well, we are not going to be making any enols. And if you need a refresher on the keto enol and enolization of the carbonyls, 
I do have a dedicated video on that, so you might want to check it out if you need a refresher. Now, since we're talking about the substitution in carbonyls, it's a good idea to review which carbonyls are actually useful in this reaction. Whenever we are talking about carbonyls, that is actually a huge family of different functional groups, which contains aldehydes, ketones, and various carboxylic acids and carboxylic acid derivatives. Now, when it comes to the alpha substitution, the most common carbonyl that you're going to be seeing here is going to be a ketone. Those guys are going to be all over the place with these reactions. When it comes to the carboxylic acid derivatives, the only useful derivative is going to be an ester for us. The other derivatives, like amides or acid chlorides, could potentially participate in this type of chemistry, but generally speaking, they are going to have a lot of other problems associated with that chemistry, so we are not going to use them that often. Now, when it comes to aldehydes, well, there is a problem here. Inalization of aldehydes on basic conditions unfortunately only works on paper. In reality, it is extremely difficult to convert a, an aldehyde into the corresponding enolate using strong bases. Even something as bulky and as non-nucleophilic as LDA will have a hard time uh, analyzing aldehydes and instead will do the nucleophilic attack on that carbonyl. So unfortunately, that reaction is not that useful for us in reality. Although, I know that some instructors have absolutely no problems writing that in their classrooms. Instead, if we want to perform an alpha alkylation of the aldehyde, we want to use the stork enamine synthesis, which is a synthetic process procedure that kind of converts an aldehyde into an enolate-like species, an enamine, and then that enamine can participate in the alkylation reaction. So, if your instructor does teach you the direct alkylation of aldehydes by uh, enolizing it with a strong base like an LDA or hydrides, I guess that'll work for your class, but just keep in mind that that is not real chemistry, that's paper chemistry and it doesn't really work in reality. And instead, if we were to do the reaction with an aldehyde, we would always go through the stork enamine synthesis instead. And finally, I want to mention that the alkylation part of this reaction itself is an SN2 mechanism, which means that we are going to be fairly sensitive to steric hindrances, and the alkyl halides that you're going to be using for this reaction should probably be primary alkyl halides. So we're typically going to see this reaction happening with either primary alkyl halides, allylic halides, or or benzylic halides. And as I've mentioned before, due to the steric hindrances, the reaction doesn't work well for the secondary alkyl halides, especially for the bulkier ones. And as we would expect, it basically doesn't work at all for the tertiary alkyl halides. There are some interesting examples of uh, cellul enolates that work with tertiary alkyl halides over some titanium catalysts, but that goes beyond the scope of this video, so maybe at some point I'll make a video about those reactions but that's definitely not a common reaction of uh, enolates with alkyl halides. And so now, when we know all the important bits and pieces, we can start talking about the mechanism of this reaction. I will use acetone over here as my example compound, and the first step in the reaction is going to be the enolization of our carbonyl, so we are going to locate the alpha positions, in this case we have two alpha positions and I'm only going to be using one of those, and I'm going to highlight one of the hydrogens here in the alpha position. So now LDA can come in and deprotonate that position, like so, giving us the corresponding enolate species, along with the uh, diazepropylamine that we don't really care about. Now, the enolate that we have just formed is, of course, a resonance-stabilized species, so we can draw the following two resonance contributors, where the major contributor is going to be the one with the negative charge on the oxygen, and the minor contributor is going to be the one with the negative charge on the carbon. Now, next, I'm going to bring bring my alkyl halide, and I'll take something simple like methyl iodide here. This part of the mechanism is going to be our SN2 step, so our nucleophile is going to attack the electrophilic carbon of our alkyl halide and displace our living group, which in this case is going to be iodine. We can show it from the minor resonance contributor the way I did, 
or if you like we can use the major resonance contributor and in this case our curved arrows would look like so which actually would be a more correct way to show this part of the mechanism since we should always be drawing our mechanisms through major resonance contributors and as a result of this nucleophilic attack we have created a new bond right over here so i'm going to denote it with the nb which of course stands for the new bond an important thing here to keep in mind about this nucleophilic attack that we are always going to be opting for the attack via the carbon rather than the oxygen atom so while both oxygen and carbon here are nucleophilic remember to always perform the carbon attack and not the oxygen attack now is it possible to use oxygen as our nucleophile yeah absolutely we could potentially do that however this side reaction over here that i have with my oxygen is typically not favored in the conditions in which we're doing this reaction and the explanation for why our side reaction is actually going to be just giving us a minor product is rather complex we would have to look at the molecular orbitals the interaction of different molecular orbitals the uh prevalence of the side reactions is going to depend on the nature of our living group on how exactly we made our enolate etc so it's not a very straightforward thing and as i said within the scope of our course within the scope of what you're going to be seeing in your class we are basically going to ignore the o attack and always go with the carbon attack because in the conditions how we perform this reaction within the scope of our class that is always going to be the major product the carbon carbon bond formation rather than the carbon oxygen formation so i will emphasize again that you should be doing the c attack and not the o attack in your class later on if you take advanced organic chemistry you will learn how to actually tweak the conditions of this reaction and you will be able to perform the o attack as the major product but for right now carbon is the king so as you can see from the mechanistic standpoint the reaction is rather simple you just got to remember that not every carbonyl is suitable not every alkyl halide is suitable so all of those things can potentially come in very handy when you are planning your synthesis so let's look at a few examples in my first example i'm going to start with acetophenone treat that with LDA and then follow up with the allyl bromide. Well, in this case, the first step, just like before, is going to be the enolization of our carbonyl. We only have one alpha position with hydrogens, so that is going to be the alpha position that we are going to enolize here. So let me show this hydrogen over here, and I will also squeeze my LDA up above, so LDA comes in, pulls that proton off, giving me the corresponding enolate. Now, the next thing is going to be the nucleophilic attack on my alkyl halide. So I'm going to redraw my alkyl halide like so. And now with my curved arrows, I'm going to show the nucleophilic attack from carbon onto my alkyl halide displacing my bromine here because remember we want to show the interaction between this carbon and this highlighted carbon and as a result of my nucleophilic attack i am making a new carbon carbon bond right over here between the carbon that is my alpha position and the carbon where the living group used to be and that is our final product now for my next example i'm going to start with the cyclopentanone molecule i'm going to treat it with sodium hydride which is a very strong base and then we will follow it up with the benzyl bromide so step number one just like what we would expect is going to be the enolization now our base is going to be hydride so i'm going to show my uh, alpha hydrogens and i'm going to show my hydride over here h minus and that hydride is going to come in and pull one of those protons off giving me the corresponding enolate and like in the previous case i am just showing the major contributor with the minus on the oxygen now here we had two alpha positions that could potentially be enolized but since the molecule is completely symmetrical it doesn't matter which position you were to choose so in this case it really doesn't matter now next i'm going to bring my benzyl bromide which is going to be my electrophile and like in the previous case I'm going to do the nucleophilic attack from one carbon onto another carbon, displacing my bromine, which is the living group, giving us the final product looking like this, 
where my new carbon-carbon bond is this one that I am highlighting in orange. I also want to warn you that it is really easy to lose carbons in reactions like that, especially when you have longer chains. So whenever you are working through the practice problems for these um, alpha alkylation reactions, always make sure you count your carbon so you don't accidentally lose something. And let's look at one more example. Here I am using 3 pantanone as my starting material and then I am treating it with LDA followed up by this fun looking alkyl halide. As per usual, we are going to start by analyzing our molecule. We have two alpha positions here. Again, the molecule is symmetrical, doesn't matter which one we choose. I will go with the one on the right because why not? I am going to bring my LDA over here, this guy going to come in, pull the proton off, giving me the corresponding enolate. I will then draw my alkyl halide and, like in the examples before, I am going to do attack from one carbon onto another carbon, kicking my living group out, making this really fun looking final product. So as you can see, the reaction is fairly straightforward. We identify our alpha position, we deprotonate that alpha position, making a corresponding enolate using a strong base like LDA or a hydride, and then we are going to perform a simple SN2 reaction, making a new carbon-carbon bond, and you have your product. And as I've mentioned at the beginning of this video, where this reaction truly shines is in synthesis, because it allows us to make new carbon-carbon bonds. Up to this point, all of my examples only had either one inalizable position or the molecules were symmetrical, so it didn't really matter which position we are going to analyze. But what about something like this, where the molecule is not symmetrical and we have two different alpha positions that that can be analyzed. We have this orange alpha position on the right and we have the green alpha position on the left. The cool part here is that depending on which position we choose to analyze, we can make a new carbon-carbon bond at that position. So for instance, if I wanted to analyze my orange position, which is a more substituted position, I would use a slow-acting base, such as sodium hydride, or 0.9 equivalent of LDA, which going to give me a more substituted, more thermodynamically a stable enolate. If, on the other hand, I wanted to make a less substituted enolate, I would use what is known as kinetic conditions. So I would use excess of fast-acting base like LDA, so 1.1 equivalent of LDA. And in this case, I'm going to end up with a less substituted enolate, which often is referred to as the kinetic enolate. Now, because the nucleophilic carbon in these cases to the right in the first case and to the left in the second case is actually different carbons, we could perform our SN2 reaction at those positions, giving us two completely different products. So if I take my orange enolate, the more substituted one, then my curved arrows would look like this, where I do the attack from the carbon on the right side onto my electrophile, giving me the final product looking like this. And likewise, if I were to do this reaction with the same alkyl halide, but using my green enolate, well, in this case, it's the left carbon that's going to be doing the nucleophilic attack, displacing my bromine, giving me a completely different final product. So now you can see why we put so much emphasis on the different types of enolates and how we make those different types of enolates. Because in the alkylation reaction like this one, you can literally dictate where you're going to make a new carbon-carbon bond by using different analyzation techniques, which makes this reaction an incredibly powerful tool in your synthetic tool set, so now you can make different carbon-carbon bonds essentially wherever you want in your molecule, which is pretty awesome, I think. So what do you think about the alpha alkylation of carbonyls? Are you ready to use this reaction in one of your next synthesis? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching. If you learned something new today, remember to hit that like button and subscribe for future updates. Check out this video and I'll see you next time.